The word beaver has been removed from the Junior Oxford Dictionary. You heard me correctly, I said beaver. That industrious rodent that is so symbolic of Canadian tradition is no longer in the dictionary. So if your grandchildren or grandchildren would like to look up that word, they won't find it. Other nature words that have recently been removed include willow, acorn, kingfisher, heron, and raven. Vanita Gupta, who heads children's dictionaries, commented that changes in the world are responsible for changes in the book. She further elaborated that the decision to remove nature-based words has to do with the diminishing presence of nature in most children's lives. The words that replaced the nature words were things like MP3, broadband, chat room, analog. But there was one nature word that was actually added in the latest edition, and that word was endangered. What I think is endangered is children's connection to, the natural, to natural places and especially to places like Algonquin Park. Today I'm going to tell you why I think this is happening, what some of the causes are, and why I think it's really important, and what the reasons are that are fundamentally critical to us <coughs> reconnecting children to nature. Children in Nature Network recently cited a study that showed that children can visually identify up to 1,000 corporate logos, but on average can identify less than 10 native trees or plant species in their own backyards. And this echoes another issue to me. I work in the environmental sector, and part of my job is to connect local donor intentions with local impactful uh, environmental activities. And what I have found is that there is a complete and absolute disconnect between global, global environmentalism and local environmentalism. So for example, while people can identify with the, the plea and the sorrow of the Antarctic penguins, they can't identify a local bird song or even name one species at risk in Ontario. While they can identify and empathize and feel the plea and get upset and angry as they should about an oil spill that's happened in an ocean a thousand kilometers away, they cannot tell you the source of their drinking water. One of the programs I work with in Southern Ontario engages urban youth from Mississauga and Brampton in outdoor conservation-based experiences. So for a week long, uh, these kids that go out, high school-based students go out and they engage in things like electrofishing, invasive species removal, stream bank rehabilitation, and tree planting. The home base for this program is in Terracotta. If you're not familiar, it's a great little village on the Niagara Escarpment, about 15 minutes outside of Brampton. Brampton is the ninth largest city in Canada, but the kids in the program refer to it as up north. So the definition of up north is highly subjective, especially when on a clear day you can see the CN Tower. On one of the trips just a couple weeks ago, one of the kids on the bus, in all honesty, looked out the window and said, what is that? I've never seen anything like it. It was a bale of hay. <laughs> Pediatricians, by casual observation and anecdotal evidence, are reporting the kids aren't even getting hurt the way they used to. They're seeing more and more repetitive stress injuries from computer keyboards and gaming consoles than they are from unstructured outdoor recreation. Call me a terrible mom, but I would much rather my kid fell out of a tree. <laughs> I had to include this picture. It just came to me this week. This is in Toronto, and I can guarantee you that this artist was not influenced by the group of seven. So immediately upon completion, when the paint was still fresh on the graffiti, they obviously decided that this white birch was an impediment and obstructed the view to their masterpiece. So why does all of this matter? Well, I believe it matters because I've never met anyone in my life who loves something or take care of, uh, takes care of something that they cannot name. And in the words of Robert Bateman, this is another nail in the coffin of human beings' acquaintance with nature. And the hammer that is driving those nails into that proverbial coffin is nature deficit disorder. Or for the purposes of today, Algonquin deficit disorder. NDD was a term coined by American writer and child advocate Richard Louvre in his 2005 book, Last Child in the Woods. 
Lou spent 10 years traveling around the U.S., both rural and urban environments, speaking with children, educators, and parents about their relationship with nature. And what he found is that in the last three decades, there has been a rapid disengagement from nature, and the implications are not only going to be on the health of future generations, but also on the protection and preservation of natural landscapes. My guess, I would wager a bet, that if you're in this room, you're not afflicted by NDD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a given. So what does it look like? How do you spot a victim? Well, a growing body of anecdotal, theoretical, and empirical evidence is all showing the same things. It's, it's unhealthy lifestyles, it's obesity, it's depression, it's a lack of attention, and it's a lack of creativity and a lack of self-sufficiency. So who does it affect and who's at risk? Well, you can probably in your mind conjure up someone you know, it's a child, an adult, more likely a child, that's a victim of nature deficit disorder. And if you can't, it's probably because you don't live where the 80% of the Ontario population does. And that's in the urban centers. And in these urban centers, culturally diverse, socioeconomically diverse populations have a lack of access to green spaces, overscheduled agendas, and an abundance of opportunities for indoor sedentary entertainment. So what does this mean for Algonquin? Well, research from the University of Waterloo shows preliminary evidence that new Canadians value parks and believe that they're best left unspoiled and unvisited. So what are the causes? I'm gonna to talk to you today just about four of them. There's a lot of different causes, but the number one at the top of the list that all the researchers are indicating are parents parents and guardians. And while their intentions are pure and they're good, they're not necessarily healthy. A lot of the reason for parents are stranger danger, the fear of the unknown, the, want, the desire and want, the innate need to keep their kids safe. But what's happened is they're not enabling kids to roam, to free range play, unstructured play. There's also the realities of insect-borne diseases like West Nile, there's UV rays, and there's the growing preference for organized structured sport. Nature bullies, that's another big one. So well-intentioned policy and practice and legislation that exists to protect natural spaces is actually part of the problem. So signs that say stay on the trail and environmental educators that say look but don't touch, their intentions are right, their efforts are right. But we have to absolutely question what that's doing to our ch child's connection with nature. And of course, electrical outlets. So the world is turning inwards. Research shows that children now spend 44 hours a week with an electronic screen. And imagine if those children could spend only one quarter of that time, so 10 hours a week, engaged in nature, outside, unplugged, where the sense, the sounds, the textures of the outdoors are seeping into their consciousness. So those are some of the reasons, or sorry, some of the causes. And now I'm going to tell you really briefly why I think it's really important to me. And I've put a lot of, I've been a lot of reflective thought into this, mostly since I had a child and it became very, very real to me. And there's five reasons that really, really resonate with me. And one is that I absolutely and wholeheartedly believe in the value of primal landscapes and how they shape character. So what we're introduced to as children shapes who we are and what we will be committed to in the future. It's about knowing who you are by knowing where you are. I want children to understand the difference between loneliness and solitude, and I believe that this is absolutely impossible in the absence of nature. Loneliness is the feeling of being disconnected. Solitude is a feeling of being universally connected. And children need nature to teach them this. I think that places like Algonquin Park force us out of our comfort zone. They turn us away from our self-absorbed, technologically driven lives, and they instill wonder, awe, and quite often they defeat us, which is also quite healthy. There are places that we can turn to without external pressures of you know, urbanized life, 
And it's where I think we truly realize that happiness and contentment have absolutely nothing to do with how many friends or how many followers you have. I also believe that children need something to mimic. They need healthy environmental role models, and we need to be that for them. Children develop. Early development is absolutely based on observation and imitation. So let's give them something good to copycat. And very, very key to me and critical to me is that I want to know, I want an assurance that for infinite generations, people are going to honor, protect, and value Algonquin Park. I want to know who the environmental stewards are going to be. And I also want assurance that there will be donors there to support the park. Currently in Canada right now, because I do work in the environmental philanthropic sector, I know this as fact. Only 3% of all of the donations in Canada support environmental causes, and only 7% of all donors contribute to environmental causes. And those environmental causes include animal welfare. So if that's the state today, when we have generations who care, and when your typical donor profile is someone who grew up outside and free roamed, what's going to happen a couple generations from now? I don't have a solution, but what I'm here to do today is hopefully to present these ideas, get you thinking about it, and I think that within this room is the solution. It's within all of us. But what I do know is that the only approach can be a holistic one. It has to start in the backyards, it has to involve the schools, and it must involve the community. I think that we need our environmentalists who are so dedicated to protecting and preserving landscapes to spend as much time, energy, and resources getting children to interact with those very landscapes. And I think that we need to act now. We need to act while we have a population of parents and grandparents who value the outdoor experience, or I think we're only a couple generations away from this extinction. It's not that hard to do. When Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor of California, he endorsed, endorsed the Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights. And essentially what it did was it gave the right to every child in California to go get dirty. And I think we can do this here. I think we can do this in Ontario, and I think specifically we could even do this for Algonquin Park. Because I think it would be fantastic if every single child in Ontario had the opportunity to visit Algonquin Park, to develop a connection, and the premise that every single child in Ontario could share an experience would do a lot for continuing the history of Algonquin. New Mexico is another place that they absolutely got it right. Every fifth grader in that state visits a national or wilderness area. And so you know what this means. It means that money flows where the endorsements are. So those are two big actions that happened on a state level. But the little things matter too in this area. And so you know what this means. It means that money flows where the endorsements are. So those are two big actions that happened on a state level. But the little things matter too. It's the stuff that we can do in our everyday lives that absolutely matter. And there's a lot of really, really great stuff happening already. For example, we have Take a Child Outside Day, Nature Play Day. And while these are great, they're all a part of the solution puzzle. One of the things that I really, really, really hit home with me and drilled in the idea that nature deficit disorder is real is the fact that we had to proclaim a day to say go outside. And to me, that's as ludicrous as proclaiming a day to say eat through your mouth. So what are you going to do? What am I going to do? Someone asked me very recently how and when my connection to nature formed, and I didn't really have an answer. But what I do know is that I learned to swim in a lake, I hiked, I climbed trees, I built tree forts, and I learned to paddle before I could drive. And I do know that I am incredibly committed to environmental causes and to places like Algonquin. I'd like to put a call to action to this group today to independently and collectively do something. Whether it's taking one child and immersing them in nature, 
or creating something that they can mimic, or being part of a provincial or even national movement to give children rights to experience this place like Algonquin, I want you to do it. And in the words of the infamous Dr. Seuss, unless someone like you cares a whole lot, nothing will get better. It's not. I just messed up that. <laughs> I didn't really quote Dr. Seuss properly. Oh, but it's right at the end. But you get the point, right? You get the point. It would have been much more eloquent had I nailed it, but I didn't. And uh, so anyway, thank you.